Uh, so Tim and I, we know each other for quite some time. I mean, our first introduction was in uh, Tim's uh, cloud computing course that at Stanford that I took. And, uh, you know, initially he was my teacher, then we uh, became my mentor, and now he's, he's everyone, right? So he's my mentor and uh, uh, friend. Uh, I, I can call him a friend as well. Uh, yeah. Very kind. Um, and if you see a lot of good things that we do at Data Science Dojo, Tim happens to be a mentor for Data Science Dojo as well. So he's a, he is a veteran in the cloud computing industry. Uh, so, I mean, I can keep going and you will, you will see when Tim starts speaking. I mean, well, so his cloud computing class was uh, perhaps one of the best classes I took ever, right? So, uh, you know, it's uh, the kind of perspective that you get. get. Uh, most classes, they actually focus on technology, but Tim, uh, Tim's classes, actually, they focused all also on the business side of it. And as I said, I mean, I, I've learned a lot uh, from Tim in classroom and I'm much more outside of classroom in my one-on-one -on -one conversation. So, uh, uh, but um, so recently I found out that uh, Tim has been working on some very interesting, fascinating idea. I think without further delay, I will hand it over to Tim and uh, Tim, you know, just tell us what you have been doing and then we will probably uh, you know, uh, take some questions after that. What I thought I'd do is I, uh, I have like a 15, 20 minute presentation talk about what our moonshot is and kind of how we're approaching it, uh, both at an infrastructure level and to talk about it, um, the applications of it. And then, you know, it'd be great, open it to questions, um, both from, from you, Raja, as well as from uh, everybody who's managed to make it all the way to the end of this, uh, of this day. So with that, let me make sure I can share screen. So uh, again, I, Raja, thanks for for having me uh, come here and talk. I think what we're working on uh, for a lot of your audience perhaps will be very interesting because it's really the application of a lot of the technologies that that uh, have been mentioned. Um, so uh, I said, I'm gonna talk about the moonshot. Uh, just as the original moonshot required a new rocket, uh, we believe this moonshot will require a new rocket. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, a new capability we've developed called a a decentralized in the building edge cloud, uh, which is fundamentally an infrastructure. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about how we think about how it could be applied clinically and then how it could be applied in the research world with particular focus on building AI applications. Um, so Roger kind of did an introduction, but um, I, I've had a, a long career on the commercial side as well as on the academic side. So my last, full-time job, I was running the, I uh, was the first president of Oracle's cloud computing business. Uh, when I left Oracle, I was hanging around the apartment where I taught for like 15 years, like core computer science. And they said, come back and teach. I was like, God, that's a lot of work. So they said, well, teach a seminar class. I said, oh, that's a great idea. Uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll find, been managing for a long time. So find great people, create a great opportunity, put them together. And, uh, you know, I don't have to do any work. So we started this class about 15 years ago. We've had, uh, I do the first and the last lecture. In between, we have guest lecturers who are all pretty much CEOs of public companies. Uh, early on, we started with people I knew like CEO at Salesforce or WebEx, et cetera. But over the years, I realized that no one was uh, offended to be asked to deliver a guest lecture at Stanford. So it has progressively been uh, become a class where the students call it people that Tim wants to listen to. So. We've had a very, uh, if you're at all interested, it's called CS309A, and you can kind of look it up online. Um, we had the CEOs of uh, Johnson & Johnson, VMware, Couchbase, uh, Samsara last year. Um, part of the reason I'm telling you this part of the story is it is the origin story of this pediatric moonshot. So about six years ago, one of the students says, well, I really like to meet the professor. So I said, okay. So we arranged to have breakfast, for those of you who know Palo Alto, on California Avenue at uh, Joni's Cafe. And uh, so I'm sitting there waiting for him. He shows up, I go, this doesn't look like a regular student. Turns out he has an MD, MPH, MBA, and he is chief of pediatric cardiology at Children's Hospital in Orange County. So some of you may have run across Anthony Chang. Anthony has come back to Stanford in his mid-50s, 
to get a bioinformatics degree. Um, it takes him three and a half years to finish a two-year program because number one, he has no idea how to code. Number two, he has a real job. He's chief of pediatric cardiology. And number three, at the ripe old age of, I think about 53, 54, he decides to adopt an 18 month old and a six month old, and he's a bachelor. So I like to tell this story because it's never too late for any of us uh, to learn more and to do more. And Anthony's become a major force in the movement of AI into the world of healthcare and medicine. That's a copy of a book that you could buy online, just released about 12 months ago. Uh, and AI Med is a conference kind of dedicated to AI medicine that he founded. Anyway, Anthony is my portal into their world. And so what I started to learn was, you know, the, the just simple image sharing is complicated. So this is actually a story that uh, Anthony tells about a little girl in Myanmar who he is providing consulting for. Uh, they want to share an ultrasound image with him. They can't. Uh, the little girl dies on the operating room table. Later on, he gets to see the ultrasound, and he says, well, I could have told him what to do. Uh, even to this day, the, the standard in many places for image exchange is a CD-ROM, or if they're really advanced, it's a USB stick. Uh, make a second point. Clinical expertise in pediatrics increasingly geographically concentrated. This is actually a, uh, an article written in the New York Times like six months ago, uh, where lots of adult hospitals and regional hospitals are closing out uh, children's beds in favor of adult beds. And so the expertise is increasingly just becoming concentrated to a small number. You will hear this in a minute. There are only 500 specialized children's hospitals in the world. And you can guess 250 of them are in the US. Uh, this expertise is fairly scarce. Even in the US, we only have about 3,000 pediatric cardiologists. And they're likely all located in the NFL cities and our major metros. Um, and we only add about 100 pediatric cardiologists per year. Yet our population grows by about 4 million kids. Um, if you go to the world of emergency medicine, there are only 2,403 pediatric emergency physicians in the United States. 99% are in urban areas. Three states have no pediatric emergency physicians at all. And if you start to leave the US, the challenges are orders of magnitude greater. Even in Ontario, which Toronto has sick kids, which is probably one of the preeminent children's hospitals in the world, there's only 50 pediatric cardiologists in the province, and none of them are in Thunder Bay. Uh, CHD, congenital heart disease, is the second most common cause of death in kids in Mexico. Uh, India only has 300 pediatric cardiologists for a gargantuan population. And I'll make the last point. Uh, long tail conditions, uh, mostly we're just talking about fairly conventional clinical expertise. Long tail conditions are very difficult to diagnose by one clinician. This is a condition called focal cortical dysplasia. It is a brain lesion. Actually, that is an MRI scan over here on the, uh, on the left that is actually pointing to the lesion. Uh, it presents in only about 2,500 newborns per year, which is, in, on the one hand, pretty good news. Now, the implication of this lesion is that the kid will have epileptic fits. There is a kid in Florida right now who's about 12 years old that pretty much three times a day, he has a, an epileptic seizure. Uh, and at night he wakes up screaming. Now think about this as his parents or as his siblings, this has been his life. Now, the cool news about this is if you can find it, and that is the MRI image, the other one is an ultrasound image, you can actually go in and surgically remove this area and the kid is cured for life. Now, this is a great example of no one physician is ever gonna see enough of these, but if we were able to aggregate a large number of MRI images, fairly obvious you could build 
uh, an application to be able to diagnose this condition. So all of this motivated a team. I brought a team together pretty much at the beginning of COVID. As the um, blurb stated, I decided to come out of retirement to go after this problem. And we organized ourselves around what we call a moonshot mission, which is to create privacy preserving real time pediatric applications based on access to data in all 1 million healthcare machines in all 500 children's hospitals in the world. Um, healthcare machine here means imaging machines, ultrasound, CT, MRI, X-ray, et cetera. It also means gene sequencers, blood analyzers, ventilators, um, et cetera, equipment, okay? So that's the motivation. That's what the moonshot is. So as I said, the original moonshot required a new rocket. So we really believed this will also require a new rocket. And in fact, what we believe is that real-time applications, privacy-preserving applications, require computing infrastructure that is in the building. Uh, and you will shortly understand why it needs to be in the building. So we decided to engineer a real-time privacy-preserving, decentralized in the building edge cloud service. Now, why do I call it an edge cloud? Uh, if you took the class on the very first day, Raja may remember this, I describe AWS as Amazon buys a bunch of computers. They manage the performance, availability, and security of those computers. They deliver them in an OpEx model, and they put them in about 10 data centers on the planet. So what is Bevel Cloud doing? Acquiring a bunch of computers, managing the performance, availability, and security of those computers delivering them an OPEX model. The only difference is with the ability to put them in 10,000 buildings or in the case we're talking about right now in all 500 children's hospitals. So at the base layer, edge compute and storage is very similar to what you think of as EC2 and S3. Uh, much of the innovation has had to occur in what we call edge networking services because you are actually have to live on the network and I'm gonna pick on ultrasound for a second with the ultrasound machine to be able to get data from the ultrasound machine. So this requires you to engineer how you're gonna do this to cohabitate in effect with the network in the building. So you have to be able to do intra-zone communication, meaning inside the edge zone, as well as how are you gonna communicate securely outside the zone. These are all part of what we refer to as edge networking services. Uh, on to this, uh, there is a specific category of application. We call them digital twins, which are designed to replicate the data in the machine. And when I say replicate the data, I mean, first of all, replicate the static data. What's the serial number of the machine? The uh, environmental data, where is it located? The dynamic data, what was the last error code that the machine or what's the laser power level of the gene sequencer? And finally, the gnomic data, which is a general way we talk about data that's coming off the machine, the actual echocardiogram, the gene sequence, the blood analysis, the MRI image, et cetera. Uh, these are all presented inside uh, what we call edge data services, which is a mechanism to both control access to this data in very fine grained ways, as well as to standardize it so that in effect, once you have developed a Philips digital twin, which we have, which basically works for every ultrasound from their handhelds up to their big Epic sevens, that the data, whether it's in Singapore, Sacramento, or Sweden, will be identically presented to the applications, the what we call the edge cloud applications. This is just one, the ability to control access to this data in a very fine grained way is just one of 37 features that were engineered fairly obviously going into this. We knew security and privacy were gonna be top of mind. And so we were very much uh, paying attention to how do we do this? Obviously it's a much longer conversation about all these different features. Now, these are all presented or made available to edge cloud applications. We have built out what we refer to as a Bevel Cloud Studio, you know, guides, get started, et cetera, because all the magic is really 
once we built out the infrastructure is building these applications. So these could be cardiology applications, which I will show you a little bit of that, orthopedic applications, radiology, cancer, neonatal, et cetera. So just to oversimplify this, we are attempting to enable building and deploying pediatric applications in much the same way as our friends at Apple have done with iOS and, and the Apple phones. But in their case, obviously, to enable building and deploying consumer applications. Uh, we built for scale uh, from very large uh, edge zones uh, to clinics to ultimately the home. Uh, and from one healthcare machine in a zone to 10,000. Um, we engineered all this during COVID. So as you'll shortly see, we went global almost on day one. So while we all would have enjoyed a trip to Rome, nobody was getting on a plane to Rome. So we engineered this so that you could ship the edge server and it would take about the same time as it takes to deploy a Nest thermostat to bring an edge server online within a zone. And we actually were able to achieve this uh, last year in Delaware. Um, so in 2022, we deployed edge zones in three continents. I already told you a little bit about Bambino Jesu, which is in Rome. Uh, and you will see this in a second Children's Hospital in Orange County. Uh, and in 23, we're already planning a deployment into Gertrude's Children's in Africa, and then into about 20 other uh, hospitals in the United States. So that's the infrastructure. So the next question is what, what the hell would you do with this? So I'm gonna talk a little about clinical applications or a clinical application. So remember I started the story with a little girl in Myanmar. Um, well, uh, in November of last year, we actually ran the world's first real-time image sharing application uh, across 6,000 miles. So uh, an edge server was deployed at Children's Hospital in Orange County uh, and 6,000 miles away, a pediatric cardiologist uh, who happens also to be uh, Emma's uh, godmother was able to see it in real time. So that actually, you're seeing a photo right here of, uh, of Anthony, that's Anthony Chang. Uh, I told you at the beginning of this story that he adopted an 18-month-old. Well, you could guess his 18-month-old he adopted had complex congenital heart problems. Uh, Emma is now uh, eight years old. That's Emma right there. He brought her into the echo lab. And that's Dr. Wyman Lai, who's head of cardiology at Children's now. And he's scanning her and they are able, this is actually a screenshot from out of Rome, they're able to see her uh, image uh, in, in near real time, uh, 6,000 miles away. Um, we are adding new capabilities. So we both cracked through the problem of how to get access to data in real time directly off the machines. For those of you who've been in the healthcare world in imaging, uh, oftentimes these are archived or moderately archived in what are called PAC systems. That's a bunch of brands you're seeing there. Uh, so we now have the capability to twin a PAC system. So a cardiology um, uh, ultrasound or a brain MRI that's in a PAC system can be shared uh, as well. Um, in the latest release, we've introduced uh, privacy preservation through sanitization at the edge. So this is with a partner named Glendor. So um, turns out in images, some of the times they will actually type in the personal identifiable information into the image itself. It will be burned into the image. So this is a capability to redact uh, that information at the edge on the third floor at Children's Hospital of Orange County before it's ever going anywhere else. Uh, and then it can be viewed by clinicians. Again, we're showing you Teleray, a edge cloud application, enabling them to view this. And that's what was used in Operation Emma. Uh, we're getting ready to work with Children's of Orange County to actually deploy this idea uh, across a region. So this is basically given a whole group of 10 
hospitals in the Orange County region who do not have expertise in pediatric cardiology, the ability to get expert opinions from uh, Dr. Lai. He does, in a very primitive way, about 2,000 of these consultations a year right now. So we're engineering, this whole thing's engineered to make it work far, far simpler than kind of the very uh, uh, broken way in which they do it today. Uh, to take it to a US-wide perspective, we are actually starting to work with two initiatives that are being funded out of uh, Health and Human Services called the Pediatric Pandemic Network and the Pediatric Disaster Centers of Excellence, which fundamentally replicate the same hub and spoke model uh, across the United States. Uh, for those of you who've been in healthcare, there's kind of this ridiculous rule that uh, in order to, to opine on a kid in California, you must also be in California. Uh, so to get into AI, well, you know, if you can share with a human, uh, you can share with a computer. Uh, and just to make a point of it, the computer can be living in the building. So the data that you're sharing with it never leaves the building. Uh, and so let me talk a little bit about how we're thinking about the world of AI. Um, probably don't need to show you guys this slide, but this is right ImageNet. And as all of you know, whoops, I went too far. Uh, you know, in, by 2015, uh, computers were able to recognize images actually better than humans could. Uh, why? Um, again, many of you probably seen this slide. It's from Jeff Dean at Google Brain. It's really this, the advent of being able to use neural network technology where, you know, if I can feed it more data and more compute, I can get nearly, you know, we'll call it near linear improvements in accuracy. So the challenge, obviously, which over on consumer side, they will, you know, drive uh, cars around taking photos and LIDAR images. Now in the world of medicine, so where is this data? Well, unfortunately, even in adult medicine, this is actually um, um, Kurt Langos, who runs the AI and medicine program at Stanford. This is uh, charts that he shares. The data that we're using, even adult medicine, there's very little of it and very little diverse data. So most of the data in the U.S. comes from three uh, states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. And you can guess it does not come from upstate New York. And you can see by the diagram, you know, only a handful of other states are represented with some having no data. Uh, if you zoom out uh, to the world, uh, most of the data is either U.S. or China. And then what is that? You know, six to eight of the remaining 193 other countries uh, provide any data. And, you know, you can see there's none in Latin America, none in Africa, right? None in the Middle East. Now, why is this? Now, let me just make a point. It's not because the data is not there. Um, we've done the back of the envelope. Uh, if you took the 500 children's hospitals today, uh, their echo labs, meaning where they take echocardiograms for cardiology, so just one specific area in the hospital, would generate 6 million terabytes of data a year, 6 million terabytes of data per year. Now, if you think about that in the old, I'll call it traditional centralized model, there's a bunch of challenges to going down the centralized path. Number one, like, well, okay, where are you gonna put it? Oh, okay, I'm gonna put it in Ireland at a data center in Ireland. Okay, well, who's gonna pay for the data transfer from Kenya, from Nemours in Delaware, uh, you know, from, uh, from Brazil to, to, uh, to Ireland? And then the second question is going to be, well, who's going to pay for that? If I'm going to pull the data out, as many of you know, it could get quite expensive if I'm going to pull that data out. So it's not very network preserving a centralized architecture. It is clearly not real time. You're not going to go all the way to Ireland to get an answer and back. And just to make a point of it, it is not privacy preserving. One of the central tenets of uh, privacy preservation is purpose limitation. And when you aggregate a whole bunch of data to, to do something with, you are not explaining what it is you're going to do with it. 
And then just to make a point of it, since I have a bunch of data people on the line, the other thing we've observed is the very natural tendency when you aggregate data is you layer a schema on top of it. And as soon as you do that, it might work for uh, one application or two, but good luck for the third, fourth, and fifth. So the fundamental argument we've been making is a centralized architecture, while it might work for consumer AI, is not gonna work for AI in medicine. And instead, we think there needs to be a decentralized architecture based on federated learning. So for those of you who've not stared at federated learning, which is fairly new, this is really work that started with Apple and Google. So the problem, and we'll talk about Siri. So Siri could, in the traditional centralized model, could take your voice print, ship it to the Apple cloud, do, you know, split it into a test and data set and do learning on it, training on it. Uh, but of course, there's privacy issues with that, like what else is on your voice uh, in what you said. And also, it's not network preserving because, well, who's going to pay for the network bandwidth to route that data, your voice print to the Apple cloud? So instead, and, you know, Google Keyboard also works this way. Basically, the fundamental idea of federated learning is I will learn on your phone um, and that model and just the model parameters will be transmitted to an aggregation server, which will aggregate and then based on what it has learned from all the individuals, create a new model, which will be pushed back down to each of the phones. So this technique, which has been, like I said, increasingly used in the consumer world, we believe can also be used, and we have early evidence for this in the world of AI and medicine, which is the data never leaves the third floor at Children's of Orange County uh, or in Norway or whatever, learning occurs locally. Um, model parameters are transmitted uh, and aggregated uh, centrally before right, being redistributed to each of the edge servers. Um, so with that, I'm gonna leave you with some work we're in the middle of doing, which is building out as all of you who work in this area know, it's hard to work work on machine learning or data science in the absence of any data. So we are building a federated learning laboratory. Uh, it will have a uh, 100 servers on it in six sites uh, across two continents that will be twinned uh, to 100 ultrasounds uh, that will provide over 100,000 echoes per year or 100,000 terabytes per year. Um, on to that, we are working actually led by Dr. Charitha Reddy at Stanford, a multi-site uh, effort uh, on all across these six sites uh, with governance. If for those of you who live in this world, you know what an IRB is, but an IRB is a governance mechanism to do joint research both across sites in the US. And this is also obviously going to be multi-country, multi-site. Uh, finally, into the lab, we're gonna place a centrally trained open source deep learning cardiology application that actually will measure something called ejection fraction. Uh, and the whole purpose of this is, okay, we've gotten all of this standardized. Now let's go do federated learning research. Uh, everything from the question of what stack should I use? Should it be OpenFL? Should it be uh, Flare from NVIDIA? I mean, there's a lot of work being done by the big companies, as well as numerous startups in this area from a stack perspective. And then what is the technique I'm going to use to do this? Um, there's work actually at MIT on something called split learning, where they're hypothesizing that you really only need to learn half the network, uh, and that will increase convergence speed. But, you know, again, nobody really knows because there's no way to go run any experiments, do any research on this whatsoever without what we are trying to build a federated learning lab. So with that, uh, let me just last tell you, well, how could we apply this uh, in the real world? Now, remember, I told you the story about focal cortical dysplasia. Turns out there's a husband wife team for the last four years as part of their MD PhD work have developed a FCD algorithm. They begged, borrowed, and stole, and found ways to get data. They wrote a paper. Uh, there is the paper there. 
And they actually took the uh, algorithm they developed and published it into Git. And sadly, that's where it sits. It's in PDF is all it is. It's not helping a single kid out there. And so uh, uh, we are pushing the whole research community to start to rethink how they move research work from the bench to the bedside. We call this the Chang method, which in honor of Anthony. So we're gonna take MELD, which is the, the application they built, uh, put it onto the edge servers. That's the first step. Uh, test its capability in all the edge zones that we can deploy in. These actually are all hospitals that they work with during their PhD work and then use federated learning techniques to improve accuracy of such an algorithm on a global basis. So with that, uh, I just had one more slide and you know, invite any of you or all of you who are interested in what we're talking about to join our moonshot and you know, fundamentally transform healthcare for kids who are not geographically or socially lucky or as the British call it, post won the postcode lottery. So with that, I will drop out a share and uh, it'll be fun to have a conversation about this. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Tim. So I will present this question to you. So there is a question, is the platform uh, for all sorts of data that is cardiograms, x-rays, CT, MRI, or is it only for a specific type of data? No, for everything blood analyzers, ventilators, uh, EEG machines, EKG machines. So uh, all that data, as well as all the data out of the PAX machine, the apps, as well as, and I did not mention this, we're actually working at standardizing data out of the EMR and the EAG. Okay. Um, so pretty much any data that's in any of the hospitals, all of it, yeah. Okay. That's uh, wonderful. So uh, Tim, uh, another question by uh, Blake here. Um, so in the context of AI in healthcare, it is often brought up that the black box model should be used in conjunction with specialized people and should not be the sole decision factor. In the edge servers at Children's Hospital, how will that be implemented? Will there be a specialized group of people uh, looking at the res uh, results of these networks? Uh, how's, uh, how's that working? The point I would make to most people is the trick problem is not, you know, if you live in Palo Alto and you work for Facebook, you don't need any of this stuff. You have access to the best, you know, cardiologist in the planet down at Stanford. The real problem is, okay, and I didn't mention this, pneumonia is still the number one killer It's in Africa. But you know, how, how do you have someone read an X-ray or an ultrasound when there's no expertise? So I think in the end, you know, the ability, I'll give you another one. One of the doctors at Texas Children said 80% of the time, the kids arriving in the emergency room do not have to be there. They're wrongly routed in. And you sit in there going, you know, I don't think it's a the way to think about this, I do not think is. Oh, computer better than Anthony Chang, pediatric cardiologist, which I think some people want to use that as a metric. I think the real answer is, is it better than nobody to start with? Is this opinion worth it? And then I'll go back to focal cortical dysplasia and go, you know, even the best neuro neuroradiologists will see a handful of these cases. And so a computer that's seen 10,000 cases is going to be way better than a human. But I think the early migration of this will be as most tech, it will augment what people are doing. That's the natural path, I'll say. So there's another question here, uh, Tim, um, Romans. Is the main focus of the project to share data or more about using AI to help a doctor or healthcare uh, specialist to diagnose illnesses or both? We believe that building the infrastructure is required to do what we really wanna do, which is create privacy preserving real time pediatric applications you know in cardiology radiology neurology but that the current infrastructure can't do it so yeah the real purpose is to get to the application layer and and work with a number of different our intent just to be clear bevel cloud's goal in life is to build the infrastructure we're working with a ton of isvs out there and want to work with more 
to build the applications based on the ability to get to this data, which today nobody has access to. So you mentioned that uh, some kids, they end up in ER when you find out that they they didn't need to be in ER, right? So why the focus is on pediatrics? I mean, uh, uh, why can't the problem be generalized to adults, right? So why pediatrics? Well, yeah, a lot of people ask me that question. <laughs> I think it's because number one, um, Anthony was in pediatrics. Uh, number two, it's it's a very noble space, meaning, I mean, it, you might find this odd, but I probably know more pediatric cardiologists than anybody in the world right now. Because <laughs> uh, it's a it's a it's a fairly small community, not you know tiny, but it's knowable. And I think if you want to go start something, which is obviously we wanted to start this, it's a much easier play. They also almost by definition, they're not competitive. The children's hospitals are are so regionalized, there's no competition. So I often say, I mean, yes, everything we're working on could work for adult medicine as well, because the ultrasound has no idea where it is. But I don't know how the go to market could ever work, or at least I, it, it was not something to me. The fact that Anthony, maybe I never made this point, he's a major league networker. The very first conference I went, which he organized, I made the comment, there are probably 500 children's hospitals in the world. I mean, I'm pretty sure 200 were represented in the room. And it was the weird guy who's a pediatric endocrinologist who wants to talk about graph databases. So this natural community that exists is just so e much easier when you're trying to do something new. And, and Raja, you know about how hard it is to do something new. So being able to focus on this. And it's a mission, you know, we've had Erickson roll uh, half a million dollars worth of equipment over to Stanford for us to test a private 5G implementation, which is where you're looking at using that as a backbone. Now, I'll tell you, if I did that in adult medicine, they never would have done anything. So there's the other half of it, too. It's been a great mission that a lot of people want to engage in that will propel the whole thing forward and the solutions we come up with for children's medicine. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you, Tim. Because, I mean, I was also thinking about 5G, right? So 5G show, 5G's role should be very central to everything that you're doing, right? So and uh, uh, all the innovation that has happened on that side, that, that has definitely accelerated uh, this kind of work. Right? So maybe people may have been thinking about this, but the technology simply was not there uh, at the time. You mentioned previously that we may be able to help. Uh, how do we do that? And what knowledge would be required, right? So if someone wants to get involved, what are they supposed to do? You know, if they're, and I think most of your folks are technical, they're listening to this. There's a number of different, I mean, I'll give you a simple thing. Uh, we could use somebody to go spend time on porting uh, a particular application onto the edge servers. I mean, they're fairly simple things to go do. There's a lot of things to be worked on right now. That sounds good. Thank you so much for coming, Tim. We really appreciate you being here and, and telling us about your, your moonshot.